Okay, I think I'm going to get started soon. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Steve Lee. Uh, this talk is called An Approach to Holistic Level Design. Um, before I get started, I'd like to remind everyone to turn off your phones and, and make sure you fill in your review forms after the talk. Um, especially if you've stayed in from the last talk, I think it, uh, you need to uh, leave the room and, and make sure you, uh, at, at the end of the talk, it says, make sure you get uh, scanned so that you can uh, receive the notification to uh, review the talk. Finally, if, uh, oh, we're looking fairly full, but if, in general, it's cool if you can sit closer to the middle so it's easier for people to sit down uh, if they enter during the talk. And uh, also, yeah, there were, uh, there's no filming allowed after like the first five minutes of the talk, I've been told. Okay, um, so a little, about, a little bit about me. I've been a level designer in the industry for about 10 years now, uh, shipping these four games. Uh, the first one in the list is uh, an open world action driving game, uh, but since then I've kind of deliberately made moves towards uh, first person games and uh, games with an increasingly kind of holistic approach to level design uh, in terms of how I see it, um, that satisfy a particular set of values. Um, particularly the last two, uh, Bioshock and this, especially Dishonored 2, um, which are games that belong to this genre known as immersive sims, which I'll, I'll touch on a lot. I'll kind of uh, yeah, discuss a lot of ideas kind of connected to that genre. Um, so one of the things to bear in mind is that while I hope the ideas I talk about in this uh, presentation are kind of relevant to many kinds of games, um, I should say that these three games are three of my favorites of all time and they kind of uh, you know, this talk is very much informed by their sensibilities. Okay, so what do I mean by holistic level design? Uh, the dictionary says, uh, you know, it will, it will set, talk about how holistic thinking is generally about seeing everything, uh, every part of a design in terms of how it affects the whole and how the whole can be much greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, my favorite summary of this idea is, is a quote from this great book called uh, 101 Things I Learned at Architecture School which isn't a level design book, but uh, I, rec I recommend it to all level designers. It's got a lot of stuff that's very, that has very strong parallels to the, uh, the creative process and that kind of thing. Um, the quote is about the nature of beauty, and it goes like this. Uh, beauty is due more to the harmonious relationships among the elements of a composition than to the elements themselves. And uh, needless to say, I think this is often very true of level design. Um, so speaking of the elements of a composition, these are the three elements I'm going to talk about um, in games, which are, well, referred to, which are presentation, gameplay, and story. If we just kind of categorize the, all the different parts of games into these three main pillars. And note here that by presentation, I generally mean all the kind of audio-visual output of the game, and uh, so like graphics and sound, and uh, everything the player sees, but also like text and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll get into why later. Um, now these big three elements kind of are all you know, very important in their own right, all deserving of like, uh, talks dedicated to each of them. But uh, this talk is specifically about how everything works together. So I'm going to focus on topics that emerge from the relationships between these things instead of the things themselves. So to explain what I mean by this, um, between these pillars of gameplay and presentation, I'm going to talk about these concepts of affordances and intentionality. Between uh, the way we present things and story emerges this idea we refer to as world building. And finally, uh, between gameplay and story, you know, emerges this idea of interactive narrative and all that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, so this is a talk to kind of highlight and summarize these things and give a few tips on what we can do to apply them in our level design. So, first up, uh, affordances and intentionality two concepts which emerge from this relationship between gameplay and the way we present things. I'm going to talk about affordances first and then use that to lead into the concept of intentionality because they're very strongly uh, connected. So affordances is this term that is generally considered to come from the world of like, industrial design. A great book to read about this is uh, this one, uh, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. And the classic example of affordances in action is the design of door handles. Um, so if you look at this photo, you can see two doors, and uh, the one on the left should be pushed, the one on the right should be pulled. And uh, the problem here is that the, uh, the handles for both of these doors look the same. And also, they both look like they should be pulled. So you can imagine how um, you know, people will approach the door on the left and intuitively pull it instead of pushing it and look like a bit of a fool. Um, so here we can say that the affordances of these door handles on the left are very poorly designed because they're misleading. Um, 
By contrast, here are some much better door handles where the, the push panel on the left clearly affords uh, pu being pushed in a way that kind of contrasts with the one that should be pulled. And indeed, the, in this case, uh, the affordances are so clear and strong that you could remove the text from these, these door handles and use them any, you know, in any country, and people would just intuitively use them correctly. And that's the kind of goal of affordances, is that you, you know, we're, it's about communicating how things work intuitively. Um, we can talk about this as form conveying function to use kind of industrial design lingo. And uh, designing affordance as well is a crucial part of designing anything that is used by people. Um, and of course, this includes games and level design. Uh, so what kind of affordances are we talking about when it comes to level design? Uh, this is a screenshot from an early mission in Dishonored 2, um, Edge of the World. Uh, not my mission, I'll talk about mine later. But, um, you know, so in a fully realized kind of immersive 3D game like Dishonored, the most obvious affordances in, in first person level design in particular are visual and they're conveyed through things like layout and lighting and all this kind of stuff, all relative to the player's view as they move through the environment. So, you know, some of the main affordances uh, we're talking about are like the presentation of the player's navigation options in relation to their goals and their obstacles. And, we, you know, we design layouts partly to present options to the player about where they can go and what they can do. And in the case of Dishonored, we, we deliberately add a lot of verticality to allow the players to reach uh, higher viewpoints, which you know, afford a, great, a much better view of uh, the situation. Um, finally, within that layout, we have like, you know, a bunch of specific interactive objects that we add um, that afford particular gameplay opportunities. You know, these can be bottles that could, the player could pick up and throw to distract guards, or doors that we encourage sneaky players to peek through the keyholes and that kind of thing to spy on people. Um, in this screenshot, we have a street speaker that's hanging above the street. Um, that the player um, can shoot down to distract uh, guards and that kind of thing. And we also employ this rule that every wall of light, which is the obstacle in the far end of the screenshot, um, every wall of light uh, is connected by a cable to its power source. And so it affords following that cable and uh, using a, a panel, you know, reaching the, the power panel to uh, disable the wall of light. And uh, I mentioned that every wall of light follows the rule because uh, it's important that these kind of low-level gameplay affordances uh, like this are all consistent. Uh, for example, it's, uh, it's important that we're very clear about you know, all kind of low-level interactions like whether a door is interactive or not, uh, or where, whether this glass can be broken or not, and that kind of thing. And this, this screenshot here is above is about how um, at Arcane, it's, it's forbidden to use the same meshes for a non-interactive door as an interactive one. Because uh, you know, we, we really want to make it clear so that players don't just kind of only find out that it's a non-interactive one when they've walked up to it um, and uh, you know, when they're trying to use it. So we try to establish a very clear visual language, like non-interactive doors being physically blocked by things that are always used in this, in this world, in this district. And, you know, and on a higher level, the, the fiction of the world, like, like Dunwall and Kanika, it, this, you know, there's a reason why there's, there's always kind of disease and stuff like that, because it justifies buildings being abandoned and closed down and, and kind of justifies these level design requirements that, you know, we, don't, we can't have every door be interactive, right? Um, so yeah, we try to establish a clear visual language and then stick to it so players can learn uh, consistently about how things work and then act with, those, with that information. Um, as well as those kind of low-level affordances, uh, there are lots of kind of broader, high-level ones to consider too, uh, such as communi communicating to the player how broad the possibility space and how much agency they have. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no use in kind of designing a, a big, uh, complex level full of different stuff if players don't realize that it's non-linear uh, non uh, while they play. So uh, this is a screenshot of the Dust District, which is my mission in Dishonored 2. And I, I worked on this with uh, level architect Christophe Lefort. Uh, we knew that the, the, the mission kind of fundamentally revolved around two factions and a choice about helping one over the other. So one of the first things we talked about was reflecting this in the layout at a high level and uh, presenting the two factions at a very clear junction. And hopefully this, this kind of not only makes it very clear that there's a, there's a big choice to make and that it's a, a fundamental part of this mission, but also you know, we hope that it allows the player to look at the layout from this perspective and uh, kind of visualize and intuitively understand how different this mission can be based on their choice. Um, another heavy lifter when it came to high level affordances and exposing the size of the possibility space and that kind of thing uh, was the briefing with Megan near the start of the mission and uh, the task updates that come afterwards. 
Um, at the end of the day, the, the Dust District is quite a busy mission with a, with a lot of stuff in it that we, that we could potentially talk to the player about and you know, let them understand. But uh, in the end, we, we, kind of, we were very deliberate about which information we convey to the player and which stuff we kind of hint at in a vague way and which information we just don't give the player at all. So in one category, you know, there's, this, there's the crucial stuff about the mission that the player needs to know. Like, you know, there's two factions, uh, these, this is the choice you can make, and we, you know, we want to be explicit about the fact that it will change the future of Karnica and you know, change the endings and that kind of thing. Um, in kind of the second, second category is stuff that we, we talk about in vague terms and hint at, um, kind of, you know, such as the, the fact that you can find a solution to the Jindosh lock, which is the thing you need to open to progress to the, ne to the next mission. You can find a solution without helping the factions, in fact, if you find out how. And we just tell the player that that solution exists, but we don't tell them where it is or even what it is. And we leave that to players who want to explore. And finally, we have a bunch of stuff about the mission which we deliberately don't talk to players about at all. You know, things like um, the fact that you can find Corvo's old home in this mission um, and things like that. But also, uh, there's this huge thing, which is that you, know, you can skip the entire mission by solving the Jindosh lock on your own. And uh, it was important to us that we didn't tell the player about this uh, at all. We, we actually um, kind of iterated on the dialogue in the briefing and uh, you know, kind of tuned the, the text and the task updates to make it, well, sorry, the uh, information for the objectives and stuff. We deliberately tried to hype it up as something that is really, like nobody's done it, like nobody in Kanika has ever solved this puzzle um, to kind of you know, make it seem like this big thing that is like this um, impassable obstacle, you know? Um, but then at the same time, we, we, want, we positioned it near the start of the mission so players would find it on their own and discover it on their own. Um, so like, it was important to us that we just didn't talk to the, uh, the player about this at all and that let them discover it on their own. So if you're making non-linear levels, it's really worth thinking about how and how much you choose to be explicit about the size and the content of the level's uh, possibility space. We want players to understand the situations they're in, but without giving so much away that we spoil surprises. And uh, <clears throat> we don't want to spoil the genuine experience of like, exploration and discovery. Uh, fortunately, with Dishonored, by making levels that are very non-linear and very dense, uh, we're in a cool position where we can promise a lot to the player by, telling, by being explicit about the mission, but then hopefully deliver even more to kind of uh, you know, surpass people's expectations that we've established. Um, one final thing I wanted to talk about in, regard, uh, in relation to affordances is this kind of running joke or re recurring idea that players don't look up in, in level design. And uh, the thing is that while um, players looking up has become kind of slightly trickier since uh, the big kind of ma mainstream market moved towards consoles and controllers, um, you know, we kind of know that this isn't true in the case of certain games. Uh, for example, in Dishonored, you know, players look up all the time because they're in a stealth situation and they're very mobile and we teach players that being in high ground is very safe and it's very uh, useful for like surveying the, the situation. Um, to take another example, players look up in Titanfall, uh, especially multiplayer, because like, they're, they're always looking for opportunities to run on walls, they're getting sniped at from rooftops, and of course there are like 50 foot robots blowing things up. So you're gonna look up all the time in that game. And kind of on a more moment to moment basis, you know, players look up when they go up a staircase, they look up when, if they're, if they're in a small room but there are cables hanging from the ceiling, um, a pipe above the player gushing water onto the floor would make them look up. Uh, maybe if they were in a dark room and the only light source is above them, they would naturally look up at the, the light source. So the lesson, here, here is, the lesson here is that when players aren't looking up, the problem isn't like players, uh, players or the human nature or anything like that. It's actually like affordances that have kind of emerged without us knowing, perhaps. Um, you know, and if, if the players aren't looking up, it's either like maybe we can redesign the, uh, the way we present the situation they're in to kind of teach them to look up. Or perhaps we're fighting kind of higher level affordances where the game, maybe the rest of the game has taught them that it, this isn't a game where you need to look up. And people are kind of like just running with that higher level affordance from the rest of the game. Um, so the reason I uh, talk about affordances is because of how they relate to this other part of the talk topic, which is player intentionality. And because affordances are crucial to facilitate this uh, idea of player intentionality. I'm just going to take a quick sip. Um, this idea of intentionality in games uh, seems to have been coined around 1997, I think, uh, partly by Doug Church, who did a talk uh, and uh, an essay on Gamma Sutra called Formal Abstract Design Tools, which you can still read online, and uh, a book by Janet Murray called 
Hamlet on the holodeck, which kind of explored this in terms of narrative, an interactive narrative. So there's lots of fancier definitions that you can Google uh, of this, but my version is that um, acting with intentionality is making conscious choices with specific goals and expectations in mind. And this might sound like super basic, like something we can take for granted that players are just naturally doing all the time when you play a game. Um, but it's often kind of not the case, and often because of kind of maybe uh, slightly uh, wonky choices in the level design and that kind of thing. So here's some examples of weak intentionality that we've kind of probably all experienced at some point. Um, you know, being lost and trying to find something to do or trying to figure out what's going on is, of course, not really acting with a strong sense of intentionality, just kind of wandering around aimlessly. Um, kind of furthermore, doing something without knowing why you're doing it, but only because either the game's UI has told you to do it, or because it seems like the only thing you can do, or because you think it's what the designer wants you to do, or you know that, that thing where you find a lever in a game and you pull the lever because it's a lever in a video game and you're always supposed to pull levers in video games. That's not acting with intentionality, that's kind of lame, right? And uh, finally, like Twitch reacting to sudden surprises is not really, you know, if, if a monster jumps out at you from behind a, a door you've just opened, it's more of an instinctive response and not an intentional kind of, you know, uh, choice, you know. So that doesn't really count as uh, intentionality as far as we're concerned. And the thing is, is that uh, enabling player intentionality is uh, at the heart of all immersive sim gameplay and the way that systems and level design is approached. To us, this is the whole point of, uh, you know, presenting these gameplay challenges and stuff to the player. So, uh, you know, it, this is why in Dishonored, um, it, you know, the, all of the, the gameplay mechanics and abilities are revolving around this idea of giving the player unique and combinable powers, like blinking and bend time and all this stuff, that encourages players to come up with their own ways of solving problems and overcoming obstacles. Um, going back to this screenshot of the Edge of the World mission in Dishonored 2, all of these affordances that we were talking about are trying to present the player uh, in a, you know, information about their situation so that they can understand their options in relation to their goals and formulate a plan and then act with intentionality. This concept of intentionality is so important at Arcane that as a level designer, if you suggest that, uh, a gameplay challenge or an optional puzzle that seems like it's kind of lacking intentionality at, at any point of the way, the idea will just be rejected. Like it's, it's just bad level design as, we're, as far as we're concerned. And we, wherever possible, we, we probably slip up sometimes, but wherever possible, we always want the player to be acting with intentionality by default. So to break the concept down a little, these are the four things that I think uh, players need in order to act with intentionality. First of all is choice, the presentation of a choice. Uh, second is motivation, you know, having goals in mind. The third one is information that they garner from uh, clear and consistent affordances. And finally, you need uh, time to process that information. You know, you can't pressure the player too much uh, in order to, you know, and kind of distract them from the information that they need to have. And with those in mind, um, here are some ways of uh, facilitating intentionality. First of all, it's the clear and consistent affordances that I've talked about. Um, Second of all, it's this, uh, it really helps if you present the player with higher level and longer term goals instead of kind of drip feeding them low level tasks like look over here and walk in that room and press this button. It, it's, it's way cooler to just give them um, you know, a, a higher level objective which they can find their own solution to. And of course, this is how Dishonored always works. It's, it's, you know, the textbook Dishonored mission is you're at this part of the map and somewhere on the other side of the map is some bad guy you've got to kill and uh, it's up to you how you do it. And it's up to you to explore and find your own journey towards that goal. Um, finally is this um, idea of player-driven pacing and player-initiated action. Um, you know, it's, just, it's generally, again, it relates to the idea that players need time to in, uh, kind of uh, take in the information and formulate a plan. It's just way cooler if you can find ways of uh, giving the player space to like, you know, act intentionally. Um, with this in mind, we can consider a, a kind of a four-step cycle of a, kind of a gameplay cycle. Um, I'm not sure who originally came up, with this, came up with this, to be honest. It's been mentioned in other talks um, at GDC, like by Clint Hocking, Nels Anderson, Forrest Dowling have all talked about this. Um, but yeah, it can be useful to consider this loop um, as something that the player continuously goes through as they play. So if we start at the top with ob uh, observing, you know, the player is taking in information about their situation, and then they use that information and combine it with their, mo their goals and their motivations to form a plan. Then they execute the plan, 
And then perhaps there's a fourth, uh, fourth uh, step where they kind of react in, perhaps instinctively to the, maybe the plan not going to uh, as they thought it would or like reacting to some kind of uh, emergent kind of situations that arise from it. And then they go back to observing, of course. And there's this constant cycle of taking in information, formulating plans, and acting with those plans in mind. And of course, uh, stealth gameplay is particularly good at emphasizing this loop. Um, you know, um, it's built into stealth games that the player starts in a hidden state where they then have time to think and explore and, and uh, analyze the situation and then formulate an intention before they reveal themselves and they have to start thinking in a more kind of dynamic way. Uh, and as I said before, we, uh, in Dishonored, we, we use a combination of play player mobility and verticality in our layouts to empower the player to reach safer, higher, higher places that give them more time and a better perspective for their observation and planning phases. Uh, but a crucial point here is that you don't need to be making a stealth game to, to kind of facilitate intentionality. Uh, this is a screenshot of, of uh, Doom 2 on the left, which I, I love dearly, and uh, Doom 3, which I was a little bit less keen on. And uh, Doom 3, uh, the thing was partly uh, because of its move towards a scary horror game kind of vibe. Uh, it had a lot of monsters kind of popping out of nowhere and, and you know, trying to eat your face and that kind of thing. And, uh, Often it would like teleport monsters behind you after like doing something arbitrary, like picking up some ammo or pulling a lever or something like that. And this kind of works for the horror vibe that, that it was going for. But the, the kind of flip side to this is that this reliance on frequent surprises, uh, where the player has no way of knowing what's going on until it's in their face, um, it has a side effect of killing a lot of the player's ability to act with intentionality. And it's kind of reduced to very short-term twitchy responses to things that they didn't expect. Now, uh, Doom 2 generally had you know, some of these surprises too. Sometimes you would open a door and a pinky is like in your face and that kind of thing. But it, as well, it also offered way more situations where um, you know, the player was in a much bigger area where they had time to consider the situation and always choose which weapon they wanted to use against these set of monsters I've seen. And also in the screenshot on the left, which is from uh, a classic level called Barrels of Fun, um, it would even use setups where enemies were facing away from the player. So it was almost like a, they, they managed to find ways to almost Im implement a kind of stealth-like approach to the game, where you can, you, know, you can see the situation before anyone even knows you're there. Uh, a final point about intentionality is that um, it affects how players perceive linearity in level design. Uh, generally, I would say if, if linearity feels bad, part of the reason, at least, is often because the intentionality is kind of lacking or a little weak. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, Half-Life 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. And one of the th things that people often praise it for is this idea that it, makes, uh, it does a really good job of feeling a lot less linear than it really is. And uh, I think there's a lot of reasons for this, you know, and an engaging story with well-written characters helps a lot. Um, but yeah, like I say, intentionality, I think, explains some of this as well. Um, the thing is here is that Valve have playtested their levels so much and iterated on their affordances uh, so much that in general, They've, they've managed to align what the player wants to do with the thing that they have to do. And so even though the game is linear, it rarely feels like you're doing things without knowing why or just because the game told you to. Um, on a similar note, Portal is even more linear than Half-Life 2. And yet, generally speaking, you know, very few people complained about it being linear. It's because even though there's usually only one solution to progress, you know, being a puzzle game and all, um, the player is given the time and the freedom and just the right information uh, to constantly experiment with the portal gun with intentionality in order to solve that solution. Uh, one way of looking at it, uh, it might sound kind of goofy, but I, I was thinking about how the more linear your game is, um, the more you could kind of say that your job as a level designer kind of has parallels with what the guy is doing in, in uh, Inception, in the sense that you're trying to present, kind of design and present situations in such a way that players will naturally learn and want to do the thing that you want them to do, but they will feel that it was their idea all along. And if you get this right, generally speaking, linearity stops being a problem. But if you get it wrong, you know, the players kind of jolted out of the experience, they're kind of conscious of, of the artificiality of the experience, and, and they'll reject it. You know, they'll, they'll, it they won't be as engaged as a result. So the overall point here is that, uh, you know, whether your game is linear or non-linear, uh, intentionality is pretty cr crucial and fundamental to the gameplay experience. I have a little uh, note to myself about taking a sip of water here, so that's what I'll do. Um, okay, so number two of the three big topics. 
uh, which emerges from this relationship between the way we present things and the story, um, is this idea of world building. Uh, I mentioned earlier on, you know, games like Half-Life and uh, uh, Bioshock and Dishonored, you know, these are all games that are praised for like, this uh, very rich, vivid sense of place and their world building. And uh, to be honest, a lot of this is kind of art direction stuff and high level story stuff, which uh, especially if you're in a big company, you won't really have a hand in uh, kind of, you know, playing with yourself. But I think there's still a lot you can contribute on a lower level uh, in order to kind of add to the world building. So with this in mind, I'm going to present these kind of three little goals for world building, which is to create a world that feels unique, uh, cohesive, and meaningful. And uh, with those tips, uh, sorry, with those goals in mind are a few tips. So number one is that uh, I suggest that world building must always be specific. Uh, I mean this uh, in, both in terms of like being detailed in, in the, kind of, the kind of ideas you're presenting and not just being vague ideas of like, it's the future and there's war and corporations. Like if, you, if that's all you present, then you, you might be establishing genre, but you're not really building a specific world. And, finally, and the other thing is that, it, yeah, like I said, the idea must be the more specific to your world that this idea is, like this particular game's world and not like all sci-fi games or all noir games or whatever, you know, the more you're building a, a particular thing because, you know, people can only judge your world based on the things that are unique about it. Or the, those are the things that will stand out the most. And, uh, you know, one thing is here that it doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be completely original. Um, Harvey Smith, our creative director on Dishonored 2, he talks a lot about, um, in interviews and stuff, about, um, uh, well, he used Kieran Jindosh as an example of how He's kind of a, quite a well-used archetype in this kind of game. He's kind of a crazy, evil, genius scientist guy. Um, but by layering details and specificity on top of this archetype, he turns, uh, you know, he turns the character from someone who could, who could feel like a bit of a cliche into someone who feels unique enough to contribute to this world uh, and the world building. You know, so to run through those examples, you know, our crazy, evil scientist guy happens to look like this weird love child of like Nikola Tesla and Prince. Uh, you know, he, he builds robots and gives them his own voice, which is a bit weird. And uh, you know, when he's tasked with like, securing a, a, an important building, he does it with this super obscure puzzle, the Jindosh Luck, um, as a way of kind of reveling in his own intellect. And finally, he, he, you know, he lost his finger and thumb in an industrial accent, and he has this bionic thumb that he can smoke like a pipe. And it's just, you know, these details might seem kind of trivial on their own, but all, uh, all together, they add enough specificity to the character to make him stop feeling like just kind of a, a trope or whatever, um, and becomes unique enough to contrib contribute to the world building. With that kind of stuff in mind, I tried to populate the Dust District, which was my mission, um, with scenes that help build the world and tell, tell stories that feel specific to the Dishonored universe and also to this, this particular district, which has its own unique story. So just to run, them, uh, run through them quickly, like this, uh, on the left is a scene about the inside the, the black market, which is kind of a you know, video game shop where you can go in and talk to someone and uh, you spend your money on nice items and things. Um, but I didn't want it to just be a pure gameplay thing. Uh, so I added this scene where howlers, uh, who are like the, the crime mafia-like style faction, um, they're harassing the shopkeeper for protection money and uh, supposedly kind of claiming that they're protecting them from the overseers who wouldn't agree with the fact that they're selling magical stuff, like bone charms and stuff, in their shop. Um, the scene in the middle is this uh, scene where overseers are executing civilians for breaking their kind of um, religious principles and doing things that are considered impure and forbidden. Again, which is this kind of an idea that's quite specific to their ideology and is kind of fleshing out them as a faction. And on the right, there's a scene where uh, inside the over overseer outpost where an overseer is mercy killing a friend, another overseer, after he was mortally wounded in a fight with Howlers. And uh, you know, through the way it's done and uh, the way they talk about it, I hope that it reflects a special kind of discipline and conviction that, it, that characterizes the way the overseers think. And so all of, all of these scenes are supposed to kind of um, you know, convey information that is specific to these factions in this district and this game. Um, so yeah, in general, world building, is, uh, it should be as specific as we can make it. Uh, the point number two was that uh, we should always be world building. You know? like, try not to see it as something where you kind of, uh, off the critical path, you have like a small little room with some world building stuff and then you go back to the gameplay where you're shooting monsters. Like, try and, if you can try and approach every idea in your level as an opportunity uh, to, to build the world. You know? Every NPC you play so you can talk to, every objective or side quest, every 
every kind of piece of loot that you place in a meaningful position could be, you know, can develop the world uh, in, in some way. So try and look at all of these things as opportunities. And I've got a couple of you know, kind of small examples of this. It's just that um, in, uh, in the dust district, this, this building on the, uh, on the right, the one in the red, um, originally this was just like a facade, like an empty building with no interior that you couldn't go into. Um, and at some point I, I realized that it would be really useful to open up the building so you can go in and, you know, so to present the player with more navigation options around this area. And uh, we could have easily made this just like another generic abandoned apartment. But instead, like through the way we, we did the kind of set dressing and the appropriate placement of loot, and by adding a note for the player to read, uh, we tried to tell a story about someone who used to live here but got kicked out by the overseers when they were kind of moving into the territory and uh, you know, invading on, on the area. So it's just a small example of how something that could have been just this generic empty room, we, we used even that to tell a story. And uh, similarly, with a room inside the overseer outpost, um, you know, I knew that from a gameplay and exploration point of view, I wanted a room with juicy loot to pick up. Um, and again, we, we tried to find a way that is specific to kind of not only justify it in the world, but to you know, build the world of it. So we, we made it into a room where the overseers are confiscating things that kind of break their religious principles. And so we, uh, we chose to add like bone charms and stuff like that in there to support this idea. Um, and the third, third point is about world building, particularly in this kind of game, maybe. Uh, maybe not for all kinds of games. But it's, it's good to be, if your world building says things about the people in the world. Um, world building is a form of storytelling, and stories are always about people. Um, in film, there's a great example of this uh, in Children of Men, uh, which I really recommend if you haven't seen it, um, in, in which the world building is always about people and, and what would become of us in a world where hope is kind of fading away. Um, in practically every shot of this movie, the background and the mise-en-scene and all that stuff is, is speaking to us about how this loss of hope would change our society. You know, uh, it would change like, the role of police, uh, people's political values, like attitudes to immigrants and that kind of thing, and even our attitudes to suicide in this case. Um, in games, the, the classic example is Bioshock, where you know, every part of its world is trying to tell and support this idea of um, how a society might crumble if people were you know, relentlessly pursuing progress in this Randian objectivist kind of way. Um, one little thing I really like in the game uh, Metro 2033, which is this kind of post-apocalyptic uh, game um, is this decision to show a child playing with a toy car inside the player's hub area with an adult watching over him. Um, it feels quite memorable and appropriate and meaningful in the context of this particular game because it symbolizes how people in this world aren't just killing the monsters because monsters are bad, but they're, they're trying to save uh, the future and build a future for their children. And it supports the game's kind of recurring ideas and themes that are reflected throughout the game and in its branching endings and stuff about how survival in this world is about more than just like fighting and defeating enemies, but it's also about holding on to like our wisdom and compassion and empathy during kind of dark times. So it's, you know, it's, it's a simple idea, but it resonates with the particular themes of this particular game and world. Um, and for me, uh, in the case of Dishonored, you know, in my head, it's, the world is uh, generally about like power relationships and corruption, and this idea that everyone, depending on their place in society, is kind of either screwing somebody else over or being screwed over by somebody else. And of course, it's the lower class citizens who get screwed the most. So for example, in the Dust District, um, which is kind of like this lower class area near the uh, kind of a mining district, um, we added this uh, kind of wooden, weird wooden kind of raised street structure that people have built uh, in response to the dust storms and environmental problems that have been caused by the Duke. And so they've kind of been figuratively pushed underground by the problems caused by the, the people in power. But also they're kind of trapped literally in the middle of these, this ideological fight between the two factions. And this street is placed in the middle of the map in between those two HQs. And so it's supposed to be something that, you know, more than just look, looking cool, it's meant to be a symbol of, uh, you know, something that is unique to this, the story of this district and its people and support the broader themes and the tone of the dishonored universe in general. This idea that people are being are victims of the, the people above them, essentially. Um, so yeah, to summarize, you know, um, three points. One, point number one was world building must be specific. Uh, point number two was always be world building and don't just see it as a, a kind of extra thing. And point number three was, uh, you know, the importance of, of saying things about people in your world, 
of relating to human ideas in general. Um, and the third part is, uh, how am I doing for time? Oh, that's bad. But the third part is uh, interactive narrative, this idea that emerges from the relationship between inter interactivity and story. Um, so one little disclaimer here is that this is a huge topic that I should not be trying to tackle in 15 minutes. But uh, I'm gonna try and hone in on one or two particular ways of approaching this topic that are kind of resonate with me personally and that I kind of think are a big deal. Um, I realized that um, everything, or most of the stuff I wanted to say related to this idea of show and tell. Um, and specifically the fact that in the context of um, interactive narrative in particular, I, I don't think this is a really good phrase for us to, to kind of use as a guiding principle and, and I think we should be careful about it. Um, it's useful for a lot of aspects of level design, like uh, the world building stuff, in the sense that it encourages people to think about communicating stuff visually and in the world in front of the player, which is cool. Um, and not, you know, not just using cutscenes and big blocks of text and stuff like that. But my, my argument would be that specifically if in, in, in terms of like interactive narrative, only show, showing and telling things is just not the full thing. We, should, we need to do more than that. Um, and the, the reason why this phrase is kind of problematic is because we've lifted it from passive mediums like uh, films and novels, and uh, you know, which, which don't need to worry about interactivity at all. So with that said, like, I think we can get somewhere that's more useful to us if we look at what this phrase means to those mediums rather than focusing on the phrase itself. Um, so to explain what I mean by this, like, um, in film, show, don't tell is uh, generally about this idea of telling the story using the unique strength of the medium which in the case of film is moving pictures and editing between them in a way that creates drama and you know, evokes ideas. Um, in literature, by contrast, show, don't tell is about the idea of writing in a way that evokes ideas and drama in the, play, in the reader's mind and imagination. Um, you know, so instead of like simply telling the reader things like John was very sad when he said goodbye or like old abandoned playground had a really creepy atmosphere, we need to write in a way that evokes these ideas instead of just like throws them in the reader's face. Um, so if we take those two key parts of uh, those kind of uh, ideas, we have unique, using the unique strength of the medium and evoking drama and ideas in the audience's mind. And personally, I think pretty much every game that is kind of interesting from an interactive narrative point of view does at least one of these things well. Um, you know, some games kind of naturally lean towards one or the other. But yeah, it does one of them, I find. And so first of all, you know, a, couple of, a few examples of using the unique strength of the medium. Um, to me, like, the idea of, uh, well, of course, in, in interactive uh, media, interactivity is the unique strength of the medium. And combining uh, you know, interactivity with narrative naturally leads us towards this idea of empowering the player to act with what I'll call narrative intentionality. Uh, I talked about intentionality earlier, but mostly in, in terms of like gameplay and gameplay goals. But here we're talking about the idea of you know, giving the player the information and the time and the opportunity to make intentional choices, but with narrative goals in mind and not just gameplay ones. Uh, I also mentioned how dishonored and immersive sims revolve around intentionality. And this kind of goes for uh, narrative intentionality too, um, at least in Dishonored's case, especially. Like, um, so like, in Dishonored's uh, case, um, narrative intentionality is kind of built into the game at a systems level in the sense that every NPC in the game can be, uh, you know, you can either sneak around them or you can deal with them non-lethally or you can murder them horribly, of course. And we tell the players that this will change the story and the world and certain scenes in the game and the endings and that kind of thing. And so what this does is it transforms like a, a simple, what would be a simple gameplay choice into an opportunity to act and express narrative intentionality every time you encounter an NPC. And that's, kinda, that's the kind of thing we're into. Um, going back to the Dust District, um, one of the main things that appealed to me about this particular mission, when I was kind of given the mission to work on, uh, is that its premise revolves around this idea of choosing a faction and, how, and making a choice that will affect the endings of the game. So, you know, the, the mission, the unique thing about the mission is this act of narrative intentionality kind of built into the whole premise of the mission. Um, and with that kind of thing in mind, you know, I mentioned uh, in the world building section these three scenes that I tried to develop the world with in some way. Uh, but another kind of aspect of it is that I, I deliberately designed them to um, kind of encourage the player to act with intention, narrative intentionality. 
So, you know, two things about these scenes is that, first of all, they're not just scenes that you watch. Uh, I'm not just showing and telling the story here. These scenes are deliberately designed to be interrupted and in interacted with, and they all have like extra lines and scripting and stuff beyond the main scene um, in order to react to certain choices that the player can make. Um, and secondly, these scenes are there to present interesting dramatic situations which invite the player to interact with narrative goals and values in mind, and not just gameplay ones. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, whenever I can make a player make gameplay choices as they're moving through a level with narrative goals in mind and not gameplay ones, it's kind of more interesting and, and you know, cooler and more immersive and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, when any opportunity I can do, uh, take to do that, I kind of try and take it. Um, so that was about you, you know, using the unique strength of the medium, which is agency and uh, how that leads to narrative intentionality. Um, if we take a look at the literature's take on this phrase, we have this idea of evoking drama and ideas in the audience's mind. And uh, yeah, uh, I've got an example of this. I've got three examples of this. And the first one is like a kind of low level in the moment kind of thing. Uh, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine um, when, like basically when something very dramatic and perilous is happening to the player character. But in the game, it's, it's presented as a cutscene, So control is taken away, away from the player just before it happens. And so while the character is thinking, oh my god, I'm in peril, the player is thinking, oh, it's a cutscene. I can relax. I don't have to do anything. And it's the complete opposite of what the character is supposed to be thinking. Um, so it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm a big bit sensitive to this. It always drives me mad. Um, by contrast, uh, this, example, this scene from Uncharted 2, where you're navigating this collapsing building when the helicopter is blowing it up, um, is you know, kind of a, a crazy extreme, expensive example. It's amazing. Um, but like, the cool thing here is that Nathan Drake is kind of cropping his pants and thinking, oh my god, what am I going to do? And the player is hopefully figuratively cropping their pants and thinking, oh my god, what am I going to do? And so they've perfectly they've put, spent a lot of money and time to align the player's uh, thoughts with the character's thoughts in this dramatic situation. And, you know, it reminds me of this uh, phrase by a quote from Frank Capra, who's like a, a filmmaker from the 30s, I think, who talked about how he, he made mistakes in drama. I thought drama was when actors cried, but drama is when the audience cries. And of course, you know, we, can, we can take that idea and, and apply it to games, because we want the player's experience to be these dramatic highs and lows, and not just something they see on the screen. Uh, my second example of evoking ideas is this um, classic pick up the can scene from Half-Life 2. Um, for anyone who hasn't played it, um, well, first of all, shame on you, you should really play Half-Life 2, it's really good. But secondly, it's, um, it's basically a tutorial for the player for picking up and interacting with physics objects. But what's cool is that the level designer used it um, as an opportunity to allow players to act with a narr narrative intentionality. You know, between the, the, when you pick up the can, the game tells you that um, you can either put it in the, in the trash can or you can throw it at the combat guy's head. And you know, this choice between obeying and rebelling is, is, is a narrative thing you know, that the player is going to consider when they uh, you know, go through this tutorial. But an extra cool thing about this is that these two particular choices, these are, this idea of obeying and rebelling, basically sum up like, the, the, the human condition of people in the world of City 17. You know, every citizen here is struggling with this choice of whether or not they should obey and conform or resist and rebel. And so by being oppressed by the Combine uh, directly and making this choice yourselves, um, the player relates to their plights, essentially, and relates to them as, as people. And so when you come up to this scene later in the game, you don't just shoot the baddies because they're baddies in a video game, but you naturally side with the civilians because you relate to them, and you're naturally opposed to the Combine based on a personal interactive experience that came before. So even though Half-Life 2's story and gameplay is, is pretty linear and stuff, um, to me, it still qualifies as you know, solid, immersive, interactive uh, storytelling because it's, it's very smart about emotionally involving the player in the ideas and themes of the story. And my final example is, uh, I might be a surprise to immersive sim people because uh, pe generally immersive sim people don't, aren't so keen on this game. Um, but I think this particular scene is amazing. Um, so near the start of the game, uh, this, it's establishing you as the main character, the, this father, in a game about losing your child and desperately wanting to save them and doing anything to save them. And uh, you know, in, you're out in the garden play fighting in this kind of very melodramatic Star Wars kind of way. And then, you know, uh, as with most of a lot of Heavy Rain, um, it's a sequence of quick time events where you, know, you have a prompt to press the button on screen. And 
you know, like uh, you have, based on whether or not you succeed or fail at this, the, the game shows you a different animation, essentially. Now, the interesting thing here is that if we follow our, our kind of gamer instincts to just try and win the sequence, we end up being a super douchey dad in the process. And uh, this scene, like I've watched a lot of playthroughs of this on YouTube and stuff, and it's really good at making players realize this as they play and change the, the way they play based, with, based on this kind of narrative desire to play the role of a good dad. And so it's cool because it's like, you know, the, the subject of, uh, subtext of this scene is quite grand in the sense that it's, uh, you know, it kind of reflects this, the fundamental nature of becoming a parent in the sense that when you have a kid, you know, it's like it changes your life in a way that means that succeeding in your own kind of selfish terms is no longer the priority. And that's what this whole scene is about and conveys interactively. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great example of how we can take even something that seems kind of basic and binary um, and typically trivial as, as like pressing a button in time, but use it to kind of interactively evoke some fairly big ideas about the story and about life in general, even. And all of this is inside the player's mind without explicitly telling them anything, which is awesome. So uh, to summarize, um, yeah, these are my three points about narrative, uh, interactive narrative. You know, number one was striving to do more than just show and tell, wherever possible. Number two was empowering the player to act with narrative intentionality. And or, you know, depending on your kind of game, we can try and think of ways to evoke drama and story and ideas in the player's mind and not just on, she uh, on screen. Uh, and so, we're close, we've got a couple of minutes. So yeah, to wrap up, um, as a closing thought, I, I thought about this particular section of a book called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, which is a super smart book that I recommend to everyone. Um, uh, it's kind of written to uh, educate people and, and change people's perspective on comics, but I, th I think it has the effect of doing this, uh, you know, changing the way we look at pretty much every medium, and I really recommend it to everyone if you like this kind of thing. And uh, you know, don't worry about reading the text on the panels here, but like this, in this section of the, of the book, he, uh, he talks about how comics used to and perhaps still do uh, suffer from people assuming that because comics are a medium made of pictures and words, that you can just take a great artist and a great writer and kind of just throw them together and you've got a great comic. And of course, in reality, if you just put nice words on nice pictures, you only end up with something that's pretty like a shallow form of a comic um, that doesn't really utilize the true magic of the medium. And you know, the experience of reading a great comic uh, doesn't just come from the, the combination of these two things, but it's, like, it's completely defined by this art form's particular set of special relationships between words and pictures. And uh, of course, like, you know, the whole point of this talk is to talk about how level design is kind of the same thing, or at least it's one way of looking at it. Um, I think we've all played games before where these three elements, you know, the gameplay and the story and the graphics and the world or whatever, um, they're, they're all good individually, but they don't seem to kind of gel so well. Um, you know, not, they're not really working together. And, uh, to me, when games and level design are at the peak, it's all about how these things work together. You know, for those familiar with the genre um, known as immersive sims that I talked about, um, to me, this, these, this approach and this set of ideas says a lot about, um, to me, explains a lot about what the immersive part of immersive sim really means. Um, you know, and to me, these ideas aren't just extra nice little things to sprinkle on top of your, your gameplay and stuff um, to add flavor to the player experience. I'd go as far as saying that these kind of games, uh, with these kind of games and, and the kind of games I'd like to see more of, these things are the player experience. You know, these, these three ideas are what the player is thinking about all the time. Um, you know, so I, I would argue that the individual pillars of gameplay and graphics and story and all this stuff, um, they're kind of just means to these ends, I would, I would say. Uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not really sure whether everybody will agree with that, but uh, I would hope that you know, if I can encourage anyone to uh, take this kind of perspective of level design, I think it would be a cool thing. And finally, on, on top of that, as level designers, when we work with other disciplines, you know, like artists and writers and, and creative directors and stuff, I think the more we can discuss and establish these kinds of ideas as shared goals between departments, uh, the better and more interesting and the cooler our games will be. And that's it. Thanks for listening. I hope it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs>